Hello and welcome to our Cambridge Creative Encounters Showcase. We are so delighted to be able to share films, animation and writing produced through collaborations between researchers at the University of Cambridge and creative professionals from Cambridge and beyond. These creative adventures, combining the skills of researchers and artists, bring our research to life. We hope they also provide opportunities to start conversations, those where each of us can share our own expertise, where we can ask questions and also question what we see. And it is these conversations that are so important. They open up new avenues of inquiry and can improve research, its relevance and its impact. So please explore, question, share your thoughts and ideas with us. We took actual footage from your research, you know, taken through like microscopes and things, and then almost like dramatizing them with kind of mark making and color and animation to bring out the, this, the inherent beauty in chemistry in the first place. The research shift might be 16 seconds, but in real time it has taken us more than 16 hours of discussion, which I enjoyed very much. So I think what we've produced is something that I could use both in an academic setting to explain my research, but also in a kind of public engagement setting as well for different age groups. so much out of it, just in terms of my own research. Hopefully, the beauty of this video is that you can come at it from any level of engagement and learn something. really done anything like this before and I was just completely blown out of the water with the end result. Doing a PhD can be really really hard and actually it's quite difficult sometimes to feel like you've got something beautiful at the end of it but this genuinely has been one of my favourite things in the PhD. Dr Alice Reed and I'm a demographer working at the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. My research investigates the transition to smaller family size in England and Wales over the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Over this period, the average number of children that women had in their lifetime fell from around four and a half to five to less than two. This is a really big change and it's part of what we call a demographic transition. We know much less about the fertility component of the demographic transition than we would like, mainly because the recording of births didn't include uh, interesting information like how old women were when they had their children or how many children they'd had previously. So in order to find out more about the transition to smaller family sizes, we decided to use the censuses uh, of England and Wales. So we looked at the individual level census returns of every person recorded in the census between 1851 and 1911. Looking at households and relating the children to the women and making some adjustments for uh, children who no longer lived at home, either because they'd moved away or because they died, we can estimate fertility rates and we can correlate those to other interesting information that we can find out at the household and the community level. For example, what occupation the, the people in the household had, how many rooms there were, how many other people lived in the household and whether they were boarders or lodgers or visitors or servants um, and uh, all sorts of other interesting information. We find that family size fell first among the better off sections of society and also among those who'd migrated further from their place of birth. We argue that these things might have exposed people to more uh, ideas, new ideas and new knowledge. 
And we argue that it, ideas and knowledge are really important and in particular the growing acceptability of family limitation was key to people's adoption of this practice. If you'd like to know more, we've calculated a lot of really interesting uh, socioeconomic and demographic uh, variables from the census and you can explore those in our interactive website www.populationspast.org. Um, so please take a look. Thanks. Bye. I uh, hope you have enjoyed our Cambridge Very Short. We now have the chance to hear from our researcher, Dr. Alice Reed, and our creative, Ellie Shipman, that collaborate on this project. Hi, both. Ellie, I'll start with you. Uh, what did you need to know from Alice to start this project? What were your tools to interpret her work? So for this project, the key thing with all public engagement, I think, is uh, the clarity of message. So our initial meetings were all about finding out what was the absolute kind of nub of Alice's and her team's research and how we could communicate that visually. And the tools I used were, um, it's a digital drawing, so I used uh, Procreate, the app on an iPad, um, and used that to sketch out some initial drawings which I shared with Alice and her team, and then developed that into a GIF using uh, Photoshop. Brilliant, thank you. And Alice, now and for you, uh... What were your expectations at the beginning for this project? Did you already, have, did you already know what the, le the level you wanted to pitch this idea? And did, and did this change after? How did that process change, if anything? So we weren't really very sure what we what we wanted out of it. We wanted, in a way, for Ellie to decide uh, what how how to best use her skills. We did have a look at her websites, and we noticed that she'd done some great work on maps. And so, you know, because we have a, a you know a lot of our work is is to do with mapping. Um, fertility and demographic things, we initially thought that maybe that would be a good way to go down there and she could create something based on her mapping work. But actually, you know, pr probably quite rightly, she she advised us to not to do that because we already have these maps um, and they're already <laughs> quite great, at least we think so anyway. So, um, and in a way, that's not the best way to get a message across, as, as she said, you know, she was, she, I think coming from outside, it, it she was better able to, to hone in on something which would, which would have a really great effect. So we just, so we, you know, it was in conversation that we, that we, you know, narrow down on, on, on what a good visual would be and what the, what, how, how best to get across a message. So yes, it did change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's brilliant. And well, thank you both so much for giving a bit of time. And uh, now to our viewers, what I would say is, uh, as, as you know, you can ask us questions on Twitter and I think you now should go back and watch the GIF again because now you can see it with a different light. Well, thank you again both so much and, and thank you for uh, collaborating in this project with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. PhD student at the MRC Cancer Unit. I worked with the very talented Alina Lot to produce this GIF, which shows the normal healthy cells in your body and how they can go on to develop cancer. Now, my research group thinks that cancer arises because your cells make bad decisions. Let's rewind a bit. Cancer is a disease where your cells become damaged and then they start to grow uncontrollably. Now, this damage is often described as mutations which are spelling errors in the genetic code, which is your DNA that tells your cells what to do. We can see this happening in the GIF when the cells flash up green. 
So what does this have to do with decisions? Well, as you can see in the GIF, not every cell that gets a mutation that then becomes damaged goes on to cause cancer. In fact, most of them, when they get this damage, they shrink up and they sacrifice themselves to save the other cells around them. However, some cells actually make very bad decisions and despite having this damage, they keep on growing and we can see one cell towards the end of the GIF that does this. So this cell grows faster, it even gets more damage and then it starts to invade the space around it. Forget social distancing rules completely. When this process takes over an area of the body, that's when you can develop a tumour. So my research is trying to understand why these cells make bad decisions in the first place. Why do they decide differently to the other cells around them? And if we can understand this decision-making process, maybe we can force the cells to make better decisions once we start treating patients with cancer therapy. Hello, hope you have enjoyed our Cambridge Very Short. Uh, we now have the chance to hear from our researcher, Annie Howard, and from our creative, Alina Lodge, that collaborated on this project. Hi both. Alina, I'll start with you. Uh, can you tell me a bit, what did you need to know from Annie to start this project? What were your tools to interpret her work? Yeah, I think, uh, looking backwards, I think it all started with like a small little summary that Annie, Annie wrote to apply for the project. And I just remember that I read it and it immediately sparked like so many creative ideas. And I, I, I had like a lot of visuals in my head immediately. And I think she really did a really good job in, in explaining and making it really accessible. And yeah, just getting me hooked. And I felt really inspired and really creative and yeah, really curious most of all. I think I, I ended the conversation with Annie uh, um, just like really being desperate to hear more and get more background information and then we met the first time like all digital due to corona but basically i think we hit it off right away and it was just like such a natural process where we kind of bounced back and forth and i was just like basically asking like oh really this is so cool like tell me more about your research and yeah, she did an, had an, did an ex excellent job just making it really accessible. Um, and I think like was always like this back and forth, like she explained something, I had an idea how I could visualize it. She's like, yeah, that makes sense. That does make sense. And we kind of really, throughout the process, we really honed in and um, kind of developed the, the visuals that uh, we had at the end. So it was a very much a collaboration project. And um, I think neither could have done it without the, the constant collaboration. Um, and I think it was really... Kind of interesting also like how much further information beyond the the actual research we we kind of um kind of like honed in on so we really kind of explore like what the what the um, target groups would be like what uh, for what it could be useful for her or for me and we kind of really all these side conversation kind of fed into the the final visualization that's brilliant thank you so great to hear about all of that collaboration dialectics going on uh and for you any uh can you tell me a bit what were your expectations at the beginning? Did you already have an idea what level did you want to pitch um, this gift? And did did, it, did that change after? Yeah, I think I, I came here with some very vague general ideas and I've never worked on a project like this before. So I think Alina, I was in very safe hands. She kind of <laughs> really just guided me through. Um, so yeah, I, the visualization that we've actually produced is something that I have in my head a lot of the time when I'm thinking about my research. So I kind of had that visual there um, because that's how it helps me understand it. But then actually working out how to convey that in a really simple way, Alina was really good at being like, okay, let's dial it back one. What's the minimum amount of information so that we can make this gift really understandable to lots of different age groups and in different contexts. So I think what we've produced is something that I could use both in an academic academic setting to explain my research, but also in a kind of public engagement setting as well for different age groups. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, so now I feel like we all need to go back and watch uh, the GIF again. <laughs> and 
if uh, you have any questions, then use our um, hashtag and uh, you will be being able to ask questions of our researchers uh, during the, um, the festival. Thank you so much, you two. Brilliant. It was a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hello everyone, my name is Mona Jibril. I am a research fellow at the University of Cambridge Center for Business Research and a postdoctoral research associate at Queen's College Cambridge. It was a great opportunity to work with Creative Encounters and the artist Anka to produce a research riff. We worked on uh, my research on the political economy of health in the Gaza Strip, which is part of the R4HC MENA project. The research shift might be 16 seconds, but in real time it has taken us more than 16 hours of discussion, which I enjoyed very much. We were discussing how best to visualize themes from this research in a way that makes it accessible basically to anyone who might be interested in learning about this topic. It has definitely taken on much more time to work on the drawings and the animation. We really hope that you like it. So finally, we decided to depict the story of a mother who is seeking health care for her injured child in Gaza. This mother and the child pass through four scenes. In each scene, we highlight themes from the research on the political economy of health in Gaza. So let us review the pictures. This is picture one, and here there is an indication to the war context poverty conditions and to the overdependency of the healthcare system on international aid. However, as we will see shortly, this overdependency on, on aid does not actually change the reality on the ground for the mother and her injured child. This is the second scene and here there is a reference to uh, the siege on Gaza by air, by land and by sea. There is a reference also to the denial of permits for patients from Gaza, despite the blockade to seek healthcare in Israeli hospitals, which leaves uh, cancer patients, for example, in a very critical situation. There is a reference here also to the Palestinian schism, Palestinian separation, and um, all these conditions reflect on the experience of the mother and her injured child. We will see her in the animation running in fear to the, to the third scene. So this is also an indication of the psychological impact. This is the third scene, and here we highlight the limited capacity of hospitals in Gaza. The whole here highlights the um, lack of protection for healthcare services under uh, war conditions. In the animation, the mother and her child will fall in this hole. So this also a reference to um, the fact that seeking health care in Gaza is a traumatizing experience. She came with a problem, she ended with another problem. This is the last scene and here uh, we give reasons for why this experience is traumatizing. So there is an indication to the fact that the healthcare system in Gaza is an outdated and fragmented system. Uh, there's a reference to the difficult conditions such as the daily power cuts in Gaza. Healthcare workers, of course, and policymakers work under these conditions. There is an acknowledgement in this scene to their efforts in trying to push the healthcare wheel as much as they can, in trying to reform the healthcare system as much as possible. So that's it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. I also invite you to browse the website for R4SC MENA project. Uh, to learn more about the research. Thank you very much. My name is Dr Sarah Hosgood and I'm a research scientist in the kidney transplant unit at the University of Cambridge. 
I specialise in looking at different ways to preserve an organ before transplantation. One of the kidney's most important roles is to remove waste products from the body. If the kidneys fail, that means the patient has to rely on a dialysis machine to clean the blood. For most people, the best option is to have a kidney transplant. When a kidney is donated, it is preserved by simply placing it in ice, a bit like keeping something in a fridge. This is a simple and effective method of preservation, however it does have its limitations. Over time, the condition of the kidney gradually deteriorates. And it also does not give us any opportunity to assess its suitability for transplantation. This is a particular um, problem in transplantation today. There's a chronic shortage of organ donors and therefore we're increasingly rely on kidneys from older donors or donors that have had significant ill health throughout their life. Some of these kidneys may or may not be suitable for transplantation. I've been involved in the development of a new technique of preservation called normothermic machine perfusion. This involves placing the kidney on the machine and circulating an oxygenated blood based solution through the kidney to warm it and restore its function. This has a number of advantages. First of all, we think that this improves the condition of the kidney and also it allows us to make an assessment of it and judge its suitability for transplantation. And we can simply do that by measuring how much urine it produces during the preservation interval. This technology is still being developed, but we hope that more transplant centres will use this technology to improve the condition of kidneys and to increase the number of kidney transplants that we do. Thank you. My name is Lee Lawrence. I'm a third year PhD student at the Faculty of Education and I worked with illustrator Rob Cohen to create uh, an illustration and an animation for my research. Uh, so my research focuses on moral education reforms in contemporary China, in mainland China, um, and it revolves around a lot of themes of socioeconomic reform, political reform, um, international relations you know there's a lot of things going on in China in East Asia um, and education is really at the center of a lot of these changes and so moral education represents one very important factor uh, that creates the foundation for the state's ideology so my research is looking at how ongoing reforms in China are realized on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the average student uh, sitting anywhere in China, what do they learn, um, and how those reforms relate to bigger questions of socio-political reform, China in its new era, or changes to its socio-political sphere. Um, so when I was working with Rob, I wanted to create an illustration surrounding mooncakes, which are eaten during the mid-autumn festival in China. 
and mooncakes are usually round and they have a note written on the stamped on the top um, and it can be anything from you know happy mid-autumn festival to uh, what the filling is you know what flavor the mooncakes are um, so they I wanted to create a mooncake mold uh, to illustrate my research and how these old morals are being imbued with new ideology and how that's kind of creating this new era ideology. Um, and Rob kind of took my idea and ran with it and created a very intricate illustration that shows the process of trying to combining Confucian ideology, combining kind of Mao era ideology and now under the leadership of Xi Jinping um, how all of those are being kind of combined and condensed and curated within the education system. So I absolutely loved working with Rob, I absolutely loved being a part of this project and I can't thank him enough and the Creative Encounters project for uh, this opportunity and this amazing illustration that I now have. So thank you very much. Hello, I uh, hope you have enjoyed our Cambridge Very Short. We now have the chance to hear from our researcher, Lee Lawrence and creative Rob Cohen that collaborate on this project. Hi both, Rob, I'll start with you. Uh, what did you need to know from Lee to start the project? What were your tools to interpret her work? So from Lee, I really needed to understand the narrative, the story behind her research. Um, and we worked like, extremely collaboratively on the process that was how that's how we worked in that's the sort of information i needed as an illustration animator my job is telling someone else's story so it was very important that the direction came from lee so lee would give me um the sort of narrative of her research i would then come up with a visual of that research then with that visual lee would then come back with more ideas <laughs> And we went backwards and forwards for you know a couple of months building this story together and that's how we worked it together brilliant thank you very collaborative i can see back and forth yeah, very. <laughs> and, <laughs> lee and for you uh what were your, the expectations you had at the beginning of the project uh, did you already know a bit what you wanted and has this changed after during the process mm, yeah i came in uh to the i applied for the project with an idea in mind um basically uh, like a mooncake mold. Um, and that did change over time. Instead of a kind of a tangible object, it was an illustration in the animation. Um, but in terms of what I thought Rob would produce, I had no expectations, I had no idea, because um, I'd never really done anything like this before. And I was just completely blown out of the water with the end result. Um, so I was just, yeah, very pleasantly surprised. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you both for giving um, a bit of time uh, to talk with me today. And uh, I think now our audience should go back and watch animation again and follow us on our hashtag on Twitter if you have any questions. Thank you both so much. Thank you again for working on this project. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name's Dr. Claire Oliver-Williams. Back in April, I was given an opportunity to work with a talented artist to create a GIF based around my research. My research looks at the relationship between pregnancy complications such as preterm birth or having high blood pressure in pregnancy and the risk of heart attacks in later life. I was partnered with the talented Shady Mainman Brown of Shady Illustrations. Shady has a varied work which includes digital and traditional illustrations and animations and I highly recommend that you all go and check out her Instagram account at Shady Illustrations. Over the course of the summer we met several times to discuss my research and how it could be translated into art. Through several iterations we've come up with our final GIF and we're both very proud of it. Happily, we've now received further funding to continue working together and we'll be creating artwork based around my research that will go into a hospital. We hope you all enjoy the GIF. Thank you. I'm Zephyr Penaya and I work mostly on the life and evolution and motion of galaxies. And when you study galaxies, these systems of billions of interacting moving particles, you quickly come across a subject that I think is one of the most commonly independently discovered and poorly understood things in physics, and that's chaos. Chaos is in basically every system and you don't often have to look very far to find it under the surface and it's not something that we teach or even talk about very much but it completely changes how we should go about understanding physics because it turns classical systems, systems that 
don't have any quantum weirdness, aren't on some extreme scale, into things that cannot be predicted and cannot be known exactly. Um, and so for Cambridge Creatives, um, I wanted to explore that and see if we could find ways to show and talk about chaos that didn't that were easier to grasp, that were easier for people to make sense of. And that's why we fell back on the double pendulum, which I think is one of the most beautiful examples of chaos. It is two spans with two masses freely moving, swinging as a pendulum. Um, and the fascinating thing about this as a chaotic system is that it is deterministic. If you know the initial state perfectly, you can predict it for all time. But if you have any uncertainty, if you just are unsure of the initial position by 1%, that uncertainty will grow and grow until you have absolutely no predictive power of where and what state the system will be in. And this is not some weird quirk of double pendulums. This is true of any system that is um, exists in more than two dimensions. And so partly based on some of Amy's wonderful character work, I just wanted to explore this lovely way in which a chaotic system has, rather than kind of one story going through time, the way that we would like to have seen classical physics of the 19th and 20th century, it has innumerable possible stories, and you can't really know which one it's on, but each one of those stories has some interesting series of little interactions as these two bobs on their slightly different paths start to come apart from each other and go off and eventually end up in their completely different states. Um, and that's the gift we made, and I hope you enjoy it. so much for agreeing to do the five minute conversations with us um, and hello to both and uh, taking part in Cambridge Very Shorts and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, so now we have the chance to hear from our researchers uh, Zephyr Penoira and uh, the creative Amy Morley um, that collaborated with us on this project. Um, so Amy, hello, I'll start with you. Uh, and my question is, um, what did you need to know from uh, Zephyr to start the project? And uh, what were your tools to interpret his work? Uh, I needed to know absolutely everything because <laughs> I did not know a single thing about uh, chaos. I'm not like madly knowledgeable about physics in general. So it, for me, it felt like very much starting from square one and Zephyr was so helpful and sent me loads of stuff to read and stuff to watch on YouTube to sort of uh, get the ball rolling and get some ideas flowing. Um, I, in terms of like what I used, um, I ended up just animating using Photoshop, but usually um, I, use a bit of everything um, so I did start out with some initial just really badly sketched ideas and then I sort of translated them into our final project. Thank you and uh, Zephyr uh, what were your uh, expectations in the beginning and uh, did you already know that um, like what level you wanted to uh, pitch your uh, research and um, did this change afterwards? So I think I had quite a clear idea of the level. Um, 
like as Amy said, like Amy came into this not really knowing much about chaos, and I think that's generally true. People don't know much about chaos. It hasn't really come into the popular imagination, and I think that was always the goal to just find ways to put um, some of the simple, inevitable parts of chaos forward. But in terms of like how it would look and what it would look like, I think it was a really interesting process of I didn't really understand how an animation would be made, how the GIF is put together. So there was a lot of working out what actually is the medium we have here and what can we do with it. How how did you feel once once the project was uh, finished when you had the the final um, product? I loved it, and I was quite relieved because there were points in the middle where I felt like I was aim leading Amy down some winding garden path. <laughs> um, it is wonderful to see it come together, and I think it tells a really nice, uh, really nice story. We went through a few different sort of idea phases, and we only sort of got to our final idea probably about three weeks before uh, it was due. So we had a sudden like change of heart, um, but I think I think it worked out really well in the end. I really like what we came up with. There are some lovely gifts that aren't in the final project at all that we made. Yeah. for that shift <laughs> I certainly plan to use in future mm -hmm. thank you so much to to both of you for taking part in this project and um, yeah well, it's been a pleasure yeah thank and you that's it. <laughs> very nice to get to know you guys and um, it's, it's really wonderful what you have created It is no secret that there is a wide diversity of species on planet Earth. Today, I would like to bring your attention to the cichlid fishes of the East African Great Lakes. From top to bottom, we have Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi, each of which are home to their own beautiful flocks of cichlid fish. The number of species is astonishing. We're talking about hundreds of species, but as you can see, these fishes are not just carbon copies of each other. On the contrary, there is a rich diversity of sizes, colors, patterns, and shapes. And it does not stop at the superficial level. These species also exhibit different behaviors and dietary preferences. We have peaceful algae grazers, as well as ferocious open water predators. There have been many recent studies analyzing the DNA extracted from these fishes. Patterns in the DNA can tell us many things and reveal what happened in the past. For example, it can tell us which species are more closely related to each other, which is a common application in biology. However, the biggest finding from cichlid DNA studies was that within each of these lakes, Many of the species are believed to have descended from one or several ancestors. What's even more unexpected is that these present-day species are actually very similar at the DNA level. That alone sounds like a paradox. How can all this diversity arise from so similar a genetic blueprint? While we don't have an answer to that question, what we do have is an animation that depicts the Lake Malawi cichlids swimming in all their beauty. When designing this piece, we took inspiration from what DNA tells us about the fish and their genetic relationships. Pay attention to the patterns. What colors are the fishes? How are the fishes arranged? Which species are closer? There is much more to the story, and believe me, there are much more patterns lurking beneath the surface. Only time will tell us what we'll find next. <laughs>